you know, calling a lecture series is probably a little bit uh, uh, ambitious, <laughs> uh, but I will be presenting information that I have learned uh, and, uh, and uh, sort of sharing with you uh, the works and life of J.R. Tolkien as I know them now and as they've affected me. Um, so, uh, I guess this is going to be fairly informal. If you have any questions while I'm talking, just raise your hand. Uh, you know, don't don't fear for interrupting. Uh, this is not uh, this is not some uh, highly polished and, and incredibly well done uh, presentation. So uh, it will not uh, throw me off. So. Hold on just one sec. Yes. I, I want to make an announcement for the people who are with us on Facebook. We welcome you. A uh, special welcome to those of you who found out about this through the Diocesan Facebook page this morning, uh, where uh, Jeannie Osborne posted it. If you are with us on Facebook and you have a wondering question, please feel free to type it in the comments, and I will raise my hand uh, and bring your question into the group. All right, so uh, I titled this first, uh, this first lecture or this first presentation J.R.R. Tolkien, scholar, artist, storyteller, uh, which is a bit, uh, bit wordy. It might more properly be called, Who was J.R.R. Tolkien and Why Should You Care At All? Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, Tolkien is someone who uh, obviously has a big life in the popular consciousness and has done so for you know, the last 60 years or so, especially in the U.S. And, uh, but I think at the same time, he's thought of as a, uh, people don't really know who he is. Uh, he's, he's just a, an ambiguous old British man who smoked a pipe and who wrote uh, The Lord of the Rings. Uh, uh, and so I will start by clearing up a couple of misconceptions about Tolkien. Uh, firstly, and most importantly, how you spell his name and how you pronounce his name. Uh, <laughs> Tolkien's name is spelled T-O-L-K-I-E-N, uh, and as such it's pronounced Tolkien, uh, because the I-E is German. Uh, and as you see here, there was a letter in 1972, that he wrote where he said, people always write to me as T-O-L-K-E-I-N, and I don't know why, because I always pronounce my name as Tolkien. Um, and so, you know, I, I've heard it all, I've heard Tolkien, I've heard Tolkien, I've, tol I've heard Tolkien, all of these pronunciations, his name is pronounced Tolkien. Uh, here's some audio of his son, Christopher Tolkien, pronouncing his name in 1991 to give you some further evidence. I hope that was loud enough. Um, J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, so, uh, that's, those are the big ones. Uh, so now you'll be able to tell people when they say Tolkien, it is actually Tolkien. Uh, <laughs> so you're already off to good stuff. Uh, so I'll begin, obviously, this, uh, this map. Instantly recognizable to, I'm sure, all of you. Um, it's, it's really remarkable, I would say, by his son Christopher Tolkien for the final published form. Uh, so the man who just spoke his name actually drew this. But, but uh, you know, I just thought I would open with this because it's, it's really incredible how this is embedded in our inner mind as sort of the prototypical uh, fantasy world map. And some basic background, uh, as, as you know, we all know, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings are, are the, uh, the books that really launch Tolkien's popularity and that are, are certainly known the most. Um, the Hobbit came out in 1937 when Tolkien was 45 years old, and it has since sold over 100 million copies. The Lord of the Rings was released in 1954-1955 yeah, across three volumes, uh, really took off in the U.S. in the 1960s, and has today sold over 150 million copies. So these, these are astronomically large numbers that are, are hard to even contemplate. Uh, I think it's difficult to really, uh, obviously I did not live through this time, so it's impossible for me to, to realize exactly what the, what the uh, introduction of Tolkien to the popular world was, um, but it's, it's really pretty incredible, uh, these numbers. And, you know, there's a little bit of fudging with the numbers because as the Lord of Rings was sold across three different volumes, it's uh, difficult to really put hard numbers on the exact number of sales. We can safely estimate he sold over a quarter of a billion copies of, of his books. Uh, another uh, important thing is uh, how, just how popular the Lord of the Rings really is. Um, in 1997, much to the chagrin of the, of the literary establishment worldwide, and specifically in Britain, The Lord of the Rings was voted the best book of the 20th century by the British public. Um, there was, there's a great anecdote of, of the reporter who broke this story in the London Times when she told a colleague the news that, that this had been, that this, the Lord of the Rings had won this poll 
Her father responded, oh hell has it, oh my god, dear oh dear, dear oh dear, oh dear. Uh, <laughs> it was, uh, it was, the Lord of the Rings has, has, has always had this, this really harsh clash between the popular uh, conception and love of it and the uh, its exposure in, in literary establishment, which has never been particularly widespread uh, in terms of positive perception. So, now with that out of the way, um, I'm going to go into Tolkien the Man. So, as I said, people really think of Tolkien as an old British man's moment of mind. This picture, I would say, is very much what people have in mind when they think of J.R.R. Tolkien. He's, he's a kindly old British guy, white hair, smoking a pipe, smiling. Um, however, uh, this is really not, I would say, particularly accurate. Um, the sterner reality, I don't want to phrase it, is really this picture. Um, and lest you think that I'm cheating with this photograph, this is a promotional photo that was shot for Tolkien when the Two Towers came out in 1954. So he is a very intense looking guy with jet black hair who is not smiling um, and who is, who is a very serious man. Um, and so, so I think this contrast is really important because there are obviously both pictures of the man and I don't think either one of them is, is not genuine, but uh, there's a wide breadth of Tolkien's life that is not really thought about or known um, outside of people who really delve into his life. Um, and so the man on the right is the man who I will be uh, sort of trying to expose all of you to today. And so a brief sketch of, I would say, the diversity of talents and, and diversity of experiences that Tolkien had, um, are, are, I'm going to lay them out here. Um, so importantly, a veteran of the First World War, he was born in 1892, um, and so by the time the First World War, the First World War rolled around, he was in his early 20s uh, and was swept into the war. Uh, this is a photograph taken in 1916, uh, and, uh, and it was certainly impactful on his life in a way that I'll get into more recently <coughs> later. Uh, he was a well-respected academic, uh, again to a point that I think most people don't really understand. Um, his, his specifically his scholarship on Beowulf is probably the most important ever written by any academic um, and in, in literary circles, that, or in uh, literary scholarship circles, that is, that is uh, widely confirmed uh, and, and believed that he really transformed the entire field of Beowulf scholarship in the uh, early half of the uh, 20th century. Uh, he was also an Oxford professor, uh, a Don at Oxford. He was a professor of uh, English language and literature. Um, obviously a best-selling author. He's here uh, in his study with the map from the published book. Uh, again, in his jovial, old, uh, old man kind of appearance. He was also, and again, something that people, a lot of people don't know, a, a very talented artist. Uh, this, this painting here is, is one of my favorites that he ever did. Um, his, his title, Bilbo Comes to the Huts of the Raft Elves. Um, he had drawn uh, numerable uh, foot illustrations for The Hobbit when it came out, and actually the first edition of The Hobbit included a number of his illustrations uh, as the official illustrations for the book. Uh, so he drew watercolor sketches, you name it, he was a very talented man. Um, a poet, um, again, uh, probably not, obviously everyone knows that the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit include poetry throughout them, but outside of those books, he wrote his own poetry. He wrote well over 100 poems uh, that had nothing to do uh, with the Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit, uh, just on his own time and, and for his own personal sort of predilection. Uh, famously, of course, an inventor of languages, throughout his entire life, um, starting when he was very young, and, and, uh, and continuing up and through his death. Uh, this was basically his entire, his passion, his, his deepest passion for the, uh, for anything really was, was his love of language, and really was at the root of everything else he did. Um, and here is, this is him inscribing a, a copy of the Lord of the Rings to someone in 1968, um, and uh, obviously had some very nice calligraphy as well. Uh, and finally, uh, a wonderful quote from Tolkien that he said in, in the uh, late fifties was, "I am in fact a hobbit in all but size." Uh, so this is a, uh, a, a very hobbitish looking picture of Tolkien. Uh, he's, he's certainly he had he spanned the uh, the sort of uh, gamut of, of uh, intensity and, uh, and happiness, I guess I would say. Um, so going into his 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 life. Um, and these are things that I really think are important to understand about Tolkien, uh, is, is that he really had a very difficult upbringing uh, as a child. Um, he was born in South Africa, it was, and that was then called the Orange Free State, what would become South Africa in Bloemfontein, 
1892. Uh, in 1895, because he and his brother were poor of health, he, she took his, his, uh, he and his brother back to England uh, to live with their families. Um, and his father, who was planning, who worked at a bank and was planning on joining them the following year, died in 1896 of a brain hemorrhage when Tolkien was four years old. Um, and then further tragedy struck in the year 1900 when his mother Mabel converted to Catholicism, um, which at the time was, was obviously not loved by, uh, by people who were Protestants or, or of the Church of England. And she was uh, disowned by both her own family and, her, and the family of her husband. And so she and her boys were left almost destitute, living on, on uh, the funds that, that Arthur had made while he was a banker. Um, things would only get worse. Uh, uh, his mother educated him uh, at this time. Um, but he and his, but they lived in very squalid conditions, and he and his brother had, uh, had almost constant health problems. Um, you know, as an example, in 1904, uh, Ronald, which is what Tolkien, uh, his birth name was, uh, had had measles and whooping cough, and his brother had pneumonia all at the same time. And uh, around the exact same time, his mother contracted type one diabetes, or, or uh, type one diabetes was was uh, diagnosed in her. And uh, and at that time, it was an incurable disease because insulin would not be discovered until the 1920s. And so uh, she died in May, in November of, 8, of 1904, uh, when Tolkien was 12 and his brother Hilary was 10. Uh, so this is a picture of them in 1905, a year after the death of their mother. Uh, and uh, again, just, just a life marked with tragedy, especially uh, in, in his early years. Um, following that, uh, he would become taken in by, by a Catholic priest named uh, Father uh, Francis Morgan, uh, who would have been a family friend. Um, uh, after they converted to Catholicism, uh, Francis Morgan really took care of the boys, uh, especially after Mabel died. He took them in and then put them in a boarding house. And, and this was really the root of Tolkien's deep and profound love of Catholicism um, that, that really was a strong effect, it was strongly affecting on him throughout his entire life. Uh, and this is a really, I think, important uh, letter that he wrote, uh, where he said, My own dear mother was a martyr indeed, and it is not to everybody that God grants so easy a way to his great gifts as he did to Hillary and myself, giving us a mother who killed herself with labor and trouble to ensure us keeping the faith. Uh, I think the use of the word martyr was very important there. Uh, he, he really did believe that his mother had died so that he and his brother could live uh, their lives fully in the church and in, in the light of God. And, uh, and that would become a, uh, a very powerful uh, guiding force throughout his life. So moving forward then, uh, placed in a boarding house by Francis Morgan. Uh, at the age of 16 in 1908, he would fall in love. Um, with, with uh, a girl three years his elder, maybe Edith Brack, um, and they uh, they sort of had a, a, a flowering romance for, for a number of years, and uh, they would they would go around to the countryside and to the town. A uh, fun anecdote told by uh, Tolkien's official biographer was that they would go to tea shops and they would uh, pick up sugar cubes and throw them at people passing by until they ran out of sugar cubes, and by which time they would move to the next table continue with cupping uh, sugar cubes at the uh, at, uh, people walking by, by the tea shop. Uh, however, this was uh, relatively short life as uh, Father Morgan found out and Tolkien had failed an, an entrance examination into Oxford, probably as a result of his, of his uh, uh, lack of focus due to his, uh, <laughs> his romance, uh, and forbade him from, from contacting Edith until, she, until he turned 21. Um, however, as you can imagine, that was probably not uh, the most effective uh, thing, and Tolkien wrote 30 years later, probably nothing else would have hardened the will enough to give such an affair, however genuine a case of true love, permanence. Um, so it was, despite their, their forced separation, it was, they, were, they were destined to sort of be together. Um, and at this time, uh, Tolkien really you know, in spite of his, his sort of, uh, his, maybe his, his lack of studiousness, he really developed um, and, and displayed to the world a profound love and deep understanding of language. Um, and this was something that, as I mentioned before, he was, he was creating languages as early as, as the mid-1900s when he was 10 or 12 with his cousins, and it would continue active throughout his entire life. Uh, he was placed at King Edward School by Francis Morgan, um, which was a, a, a school that 
and had a very classical education, so he was able to learn Old English, Middle English, Greek, Latin, Old Norse, Gothic, uh, among other languages that he became familiar with, French, Spanish, um, and he was just a voracious consumer and uh, adopter of languages. Uh, his biographer wrote uh, that, that his mother had tried to teach him piano and was unable to, uh, and that you know, it, it seemed rather as if words took the place of music for him, that he enjoyed listening to them, reading them, and reciting them, almost regardless of what they meant. So a really, uh, a really uh, em almost empathic uh, understanding of requirements, a man who, who avoided a man who, who is just at all times in love with, with speaking and listening to language. Uh, at the same, at this time, uh, at the end of the school, in 1911, he and, and three friends would form uh, a group that they called the TCBS, which stood for the Tea Club and Barovian Society, uh, because they would go to a, a department store called Barrow's Department Store, and they would drink tea, uh, and uh, and at the same time, they would, they would pontificate to each other and, and recite poetry and read the classics, um, and and uh, you know this. This group of people was really formative for him uh, in, in his years leading up to World War I. Um, as you can see here, uh, two of them are already in uniform. There are not a lot of pictures of them, but uh, all four of them would, would serve in, in World War I simultaneously, um, and they would continue communication uh, while that was going on. Um, Tolkien, however, did not, uh, in spite of, of sort of the general trend of the time, for young men, he did not join the war as soon as it broke out in 1914. He had been accepted into Exeter College at Oxford uh, after uh, succeeding in his entrance, entrance exam the second time. Um, and really, this choice was made uh, for Edith. Um, he, in 1913, while he was at Exeter, uh, the morning, uh, midnight when he turned 21, he wrote her a letter saying, uh, I still love you and, I, and I, we should get married. Uh, she wrote him a letter back saying, I'm engaged, and, and, uh, and oh uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, however, uh, one short uh, train ride later, and she had broken off her engagement, and, uh, and uh, they uh, were engaged to get married themselves. However, um, uh, Tolkien was not uh, in a great financial position or a great uh, prospective position, which was incredibly important at the time. Um, the quote there at the bottom is from uh, Edith uh, at the time, her, her landlord, who uh, was writing to Francis Morgan uh, about their, their uh, proposed engagement. Um, really, this was the reason that he uh, did not join the war. He needed to, to graduate and to have uh, a good prospect coming out of the war in order to have a legitimate chance of marrying Edith, which was, of course, incredibly important to him. And so now we get to um, the true, I guess, part of Tolkien. Um, this, everything leading up to this was, was absolutely uh, formative for him. Um, but this, I'm calling the threshold of Middle Earth after a, a, a partial biography of Tolkien was written called The Great War, The Threshold of Middle Earth. Um, in, in 1915, which is when Tolkien joined um, the war, um, this is when he really began his, his uh, foray into, into myth and into the creation of myth that would then shape not only his life, but the, the entire uh, uh, prospective uh, world of literature and, and fantasy. Um, it began slightly before he joined the war. Um, so it was, it was at Exeter College that he was you know, still studying languages and mythology, um, and uh, he was reading an incredibly boring sermon, uh, as he described it, in 1913, uh, called Christ, uh, by a, a, an old English poet named Cunewulf, um, and he said that, that he, was, he was just perusing this awful sermon that he had no interest in reading, but right smack in the middle of it came these words that would that would completely transform his life. Yeah. Which means, Hail Eyalendil, brightest of angels, over Middle Earth sent unto men. And these words were uh, incredibly formative. He would later describe, uh, through a fictionalized version of himself, um, a character that said, I felt a curious thrill as if something had stirred in me, half wakened from sleep. There was something very remote and strange and beautiful behind those words, if I could grasp it, far beyond ancient English. I don't think it is any reference to say that it may derive its curiously moving quality from some older world. And so this, I think, really goes to show the, the potency of language for Tolkien, that 
it was it was these two lines of, of poetry that he read in the middle of, of just something he had no interest in reading that were so affecting and so deeply penetrating into his mind that they ended up completely altering his entire sort of frame of mind. Um, and it was something so potent about these two words, really. Um, as you may have heard when I was reading this, this word midinyard is is actually translated as Middle Earth. Uh, midon meaning middle, yard, uh, which is actually the word we get the word yard from, like backyard, uh, but means earth or, or general space. Um, in Old Norse mythology, uh, midinyard was was Middle Earth, was the space between the higher plane of the gods and the lower plane of the underworld, uh, where all the mortals resided. What's in midinyard? Uh, as it's, or Midgard, as it's now commonly known. Um, and so that was, obviously, that, that name is, is now known for everyone as the name of a totally fiction of the world of Middle Earth. Um, the second thing was this, this name, Eärenda, which is a name that is completely unknown. Um, it, it, it's a name that has no uh, definitive understanding. There, there's a lot of things like this in old English poetry and old poetry in general. It's, it's um, complete mysteries. Um, but for Tolkien, this name conjured up an entire, is in the context of these lines, when it says, Ea Rendel, brightest of angels, over middle earth, son of the men. This, this name evokes some deeper and far more profound mythological uh, potency than, uh, than it maybe would for other people. Um, but for, for Tolkien, this, this really resonated with him, and Ea Rendel became the foundation of his entire mythology. Um, and you see here, this is this is a heraldic device, as he called it, of, of this character, Ed Randall, which who would, who would join into mythology. And you can see there, this is the bright morning star, or the evening star, depending on how it's, how it's interpreted, that uh, is, is uh, sailing over the heavens, over Middle Earth sent unto men. And later he would write in 1956, it was just as the 1914 war burst on me that I made the discovery that legends depend on the language to which they belong, but a living legend depends equally on the legends which it conveys by tradition. And so this was the marriage uh, in Tolkien's mind, um, which he had probably already understood to some degree, but the, the pure marriage of language and myth that, that would fundamentally alter the way that he looked at the world. Um, that for the name Eärendil alone, that name conjures for him an entire mythology of the world, uh, or at least a fragment of an entire mythology that is, is truly evocative and truly uh, different. It contains within it some ideas and some understandings that, uh, that are not contained anywhere else besides that single word. And the same is true of the reverse, that, that the names contain the legends and the legends contain the words, that, that a legend itself relies upon the language that it belongs to. You, you can't tell a legend without telling it through words. And words themselves contain an entire history, an entire, an entire development that, uh, that is the culmination of an entire cultural experience. And so in November of 1914, um, shortly before joining the war, this union materialized for him in an external way for the first time. Uh, he wrote a poem called The Voyage of Eärendil, the Evening Star. That, that is the beginning point of what we know as Middle Earth and the beginning point of a true mythology that, that he was going to create fully formed from his own mind. Uh, Eärendil sprang up from the ocean's cup in the gloom of the mid-world rim, from the door of night as a ray of light left over the twilight rim, and launching his bark like a silver spark from the golden fading sand, down the sunlit breath of day's fiery death, he sped from west to land. Which is, you know, not the greatest poetry ever written, but it certainly has, uh, it certainly uh, is pure in its intention to convey for what Tolkien felt when he read the lines uh, of Old English from Christ, that, that this, there's some, there's this mariner who has this boat that's sailing across the heavens, um, that, that really is deeply ingrained in his mind. And so, uh, as I said, in 1915, Tolkien would, would at last uh, enlist in the war, he completed all his studies, uh, but still left Exeter before being able to graduate. He would not graduate until the following year um, because he was so, uh, he was receiving a lot of pressure at home uh, from his family and friends to join because everyone at the time of his age was in the war uh, effectively. Um, but uh, 
More importantly, at this time, um, he had had this, this breakthrough moment with, with uh, the lines from Cunewolf. And it was, it was it sometimes romantically said that, that he began writing his mythology in the trenches of World War I, which is not true. Uh, but, but, you know, he, he did write some poetry while, while he was there. And the, these, these poems he would send to G.B. Smith, one of the members of the Tea Club and Barovian Society that, uh, that had been so influential on him as, as a young man. Uh, and and G.B. Smith was very encouraging, and they would send these letters back and forth, um, and, and it furthered Tolkien's development as a lover of myth and language in Union. Um, and actually, at the time, a book called Oxford Poetry in 1915 was published, containing Tolkien's first published work, first published work called Goblin Feet, a, uh, a poem about goblins that he later moved to the test, uh, but has been of course, reprinted uh, numerous times throughout the decades, uh, ensuring that Tolkien's uh, uh, hate of poems survives. Um, but uh, more uh, sobering uh, is, is this letter, which G.D. Smith wrote to Tolkien in uh, 1916, uh, in early 1960. Uh, and this is, this is in response to Tolkien uh, sending him a collection of poems um, that, that he wanted to have published. Um, and and Gilder, or, sorry, but, uh, Smith says, My dear John Model, publish by all means. I am a wild and wholehearted admirer, and my chief consolation is that if I am discovered tonight, I am off on duty in a few minutes. There will still be left a member of the great TCB, TCBS to voice what I dreamed and what we all agreed upon. For the death of one of its members cannot, I am determined, dissolve the TCBS. Death is so close to me now that I feel, and I am sure you feel, and all the three other heroes feel, how inquisent it is. Death can make us loathsome and helpless as individuals, but it cannot put an end to the immortal four. Yes, publish. You, I am sure, are chosen like Saul among the children of Israel. Make haste before you come out to this orgy of death and cruelty. May God bless you, my dear John Ronald, and may you say the things I have tried to say long after I am not there to say them, if such be my lot. Uh, ten months after writing this, uh, uh, G.B. Smith would be killed uh, in World War I. Uh, five months before that, uh, another member of the TCBS, uh, R.Q. Gilson, was killed on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. Um, and then this, this title of this slide here, Something Has Gone Crack, is, uh, is how Tolkien described the feeling he felt on uh, not hearing of these deaths, of, of, of experiencing a heart-wrenching loss uh, and then being ripped into uh, something has gone cracked in, in his heart and in, in his mind. Um, and so this, you know, it's a really beautiful letter, I think, that Smith wrote to Tolkien, uh, and undoubtedly what stuck with him uh, was, was, was Smith's real love of, of what Tolkien was doing, and saying that, that Tolkien had a voice to speak for not only uh, Smith, but for, for everyone, really. Anyone who feels the way about the uh, myth and story that, that the TCBS had felt. Um, things uh, got uh, slightly better for Tolkien, actually. He contracted French fever in, at the end of 1916, uh, which turned out to be a blessing because uh, he, uh, his newly uh, wedded wife, uh, Edith, they had gotten married earlier that year, um, was able to join him while he was invalided uh, back in England, and so they spent uh, his entire recovery period together, uh, effectively. Um, and this, this book up here on the right uh, says Cottage of Lost Play. Uh, it's a little difficult to see here uh, in mythology that he and Edith worked out together, that, that he sat down and would, would relate to her as she would write down in this booklet. And, and they spent, you know, a good couple of years, effectively, um, on this uh, while Tolkien was, was on sick leave. Uh, the Book of Lost Tales. Uh, where Tolkien was trying to really create a pure mythology, a mythology of, of the English people, one that doesn't exist because um, England's, all of England's historical uh, knowledge, really, of, of its mythology was destroyed in the Norman Conquest, uh, and all that remains really are, are uh, the, the story of Baron and Luthien for Tolkien was, was uh, is a story that is in the Silmarillion as, as currently published and, and existed far back in the, the late 19 teens when he was writing these stories. Um, and uh, really it's based on, on his, his passion for, for Edith that he wrote this story. Uh, in, in the story he writes uh, of Luthien dancing for him, which is based on 
uh, a time when, during this time that, that he and Edith took a walk and she danced for him in the woods. Um, and you can see the description of, of, of this dance in Silmarillion. Keen, heart-piercing was her song as the song of the lark that rises from the gates of night and pours its voice among the dying stars, seeing the sun behind the walls of the world. And the song of Luthien released the bonds of winter, and the frozen waters spoke, and flowers sprang from the cold earth where her feet had passed. And he would later relate, relate this in 1971, um, right after his wife died, uh, to his son, uh, his son Michael, he, he wrote, uh, in those days her hair was raven, her skin clear, her eyes brighter than you have seen them, and she could sing and dance. And so, really, uh, Tolkien's, his, his, his real passion for everything that he loved uh, is, is so much a part of, of the, uh, the world that he created, of the mythology that he built, was, was his love of his wife, his love of his country, his love of family, his love of myth, everything. He, he was a, a deeply passionate human being who was able to pour all of that purely into, into his work. Uh, after this time, uh, he embarked uh, back, after, after recovering from French fever, he returned to the academic world uh, that, he, that he left before the war. In 1920, he joined uh, work on the, uh, the New English Dictionary, which was which was what the Oxford English Dictionary's original name was. Um, he worked on, on W words that were descended from German, being a, being a scholar of Germanic languages. Uh, if, you, if you look at the OED, Tolkien's work on at least the word walrus is still there. Uh, and so if, you, if you're interested, you can go find Tolkien's writing in the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, also around this time, uh, he took a professorship at Leeds University, uh, and it was there that he produced uh, effectively the definitive academic version of the medieval or the Middle English text, uh, Sir, Gaw Sir Gawain Midnight, uh, published in 1925, which would be the standard version of that poem uh, used in academic and, and in the academy for a good 50, 60 years, um, because he, he was really a, a, a truly gifted. Um, what was then called philologist, uh, a field of, of language study that no longer really exists. Uh, effectively, it's historical linguistics mixed with uh, literary analysis. So, effectively, a perfect job for Tolkien, and one that really lent itself to uh, his ability to produce texts like uh, Mike Gawain Knight. Um, and then in 1936, um, he was then at Pembroke College. Um, he produced, uh, like I said before, effectively the definitive text about Beowulf scholarship. It was called Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics. Uh, it was delivered as a lecture and then released in print, um, which uh, has been called the most important article ever written about Beowulf uh, by medieval scholars. Um, and importantly, what he, what he argues in this is that the poem has been, has been lost under scholarship, um, and that at the time that Tolkien was writing, all anyone really cared about was the language, and, and, and they cared about mining it for, for little details and for and for looking at, at uh, historical development and missing the forest of the trees completely. Uh, and so it's called the monsters and the critics because uh, he thought he thought there was some shamefacedness that uh, that people had when they would read it and they would see Beowulf fighting a dragon uh, or Beowulf fighting Grendel and a Grendel's mother. All of these monsters that uh, that are totally fantastical. Um, uh, and, and you know the the, the academy in Tolkien's mind wanted to sort of gloss over that and just and just as poo poo it as as being uh, just an ignorant uh, an ignorant way of looking at the world from the, the ninth, ninth century uh, A.D. when it was written. Um, and that again is, is very much in in Tolkien's love of merging the language and the mythology together and and. And really, you know, as I said, completely turned around Beowulf scholarship and got people on his side because, you know, as he was able to do later with his fiction, uh, he's very uh, adept at uh, convincing people of the power of mythology. Uh, around this same time, uh, Tolkien had been had been writing. At this point, he had uh, three or four children, uh, and he started uh, a story that he would, they would tell them at that time. Uh, that he wrote down and typed up. Um, which, uh, through a series of uh, wild coincidences, uh, ends up in the hands of a publishing house, um, and it was it was then published in 1937 as the Hop, uh, a book that uh, became one of the most famous children's books ever written, 
uh, certainly, uh, probably the most popular children's book of the first half of the 20th century. Um, and I thought here I'd play uh, just a, this is an interview Tolkien gave in 1968, uh, describing his first uh, his first uh, expression of writing *The Hobbit*, uh, which which I think really goes to show his creative process. Hopefully, the internet will come through for us. The actual beginning, though, it's not really the beginning. The actual flashpoint was I remember very clearly. I I took, um, I could still see the corner in, the, in my house in Trenton North of the road where it happened. I got an enormous pile of exam papers there, and uh, it, marking school examinations in the summertime is an enormous, um, very laborious, and unfortunately also boring. <laughs> I remember picking up a paper, and actually find I nearly get an extra mark for it, extra five marks, actually, on one page of this. The was left black. <laughs> <laughs> we almost made it. <laughs> if he doesn't go here in a couple of minutes, I will finish off the story for him. Um, Glorious. Nothing to read. So I scribble on it. I can't think why. In a hole in the ground lived a hobbit. I think that was eventually published in 1960. <laughs> So that's, that's the inception of, of the Hobbit story that Tolkien about to tell. Um, how true it is, we have no way, way, way of knowing that the page that he wrote that on uh, has, has never been found, uh, unlike many of his other papers. But uh, I think it is a very pure expression of, of the way that Tolkien uh, wrote, uh, was, was he just had a creative drive within it. So he, you know, he, he just, out of, out of the spur of his own thought, uh, wrote in a hole in the ground over the Hobbit. Uh, and from there, uh, the world of Middle-earth as we know it was um, and interestingly, The Hobbit was, was never intended as, as anything more than a children's story. It was, it was a story he wrote for his children that had nothing to do with his other mythology he was writing, which he, he continued working on throughout his entire time. Maybe he's been working on it continually for the last 20 years, um, since World War One. But The Hobbit had nothing to do with it. It was a completely different story um, that uh, he later described as having been drawn into the world. He, he, he had uh, uh, one of the most... Uh, the interesting thing about Tolkien is he was almost at war with himself over his mythology. He was never able to get away from it. He began working on it in around 1915, um, the earliest sort of languages that he was constructing. Um, and it, it, he died in 1973, uh, and so it was almost a full 60 years of, of continual work and revision. Um, and so everything he did almost was through the lens of this mythology that was constantly in the back of his mind. Um, and so even writing this children's story, he had no way of, of completely excising it from, from this mythology that he had written. And that came to full fruition in, in oops, uh, that came to full fruition in, uh, after the publication of The Hobbit uh, in 1937. It was a modest success uh, when it first came out. People, it was somewhat unexpectedly, it did fairly well. Um, and so his publishers asked him for a sequel, uh, and he offered up, well, hey, I have this whole mythology I've been writing the last 20 years. Do you have any interest? They said, this is terrible, we have no interest in it. We have no idea how to publish this, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so that was immediately struck from right home. And so he began uh, soon after to write what we now know as The Lord of the Rings, which he called The New Hobbit, uh, which he had no ideas for, but grew into The Lord of the Rings uh, and became sort of the perfect melding of, of uh, his Hobbit world that he constructed for The Hobbit and this mythology that he had been writing this whole time that nobody, of course, had any knowledge of, which is so interesting. Is that he had been working on this, you know, for decades, and until until the Lord of the Rings was published, and people started to ask him about, you know, his life, he he had there was no one who knew of this. It was it was something he did purely for his own private enjoyment, um, uh, which is which is a fascinating detail about his life. Um, and so the Lord of the Rings took on more fully all of the aspects of, of the mythology uh, and became this this hybrid uh, form of of this this whole grand scheme that he'd been working on and this small children's story. And they met somewhere in the middle and became one of the most popular books ever written. Um, of course, as, as some of you know, many of you maybe know, uh, Lord of the Rings took off in a huge way in the 1960s uh, in the US. Um, uh, no one uh, really thought, his, his publishers expected to lose money on it. This was in 1937, started writing this book, a sequel to a 270-odd page book uh, that he had written in a couple of years. Um, 
and, it, and he started writing the sequel in 1937. In 1949, he came back to his publishers and said, hey, it's done. Uh, it's 1,200 pages long, and it has nothing to do with what I wrote before. So uh, it, was, <laughs> it uh, was not at all what they were expecting. Uh, it was a complete disaster for the publishers who thought for sure they were going to lose money. They couldn't publish it as a single book because it was of enormous length, and there was a paper shortage following the war. Um, and so they published this three volumes, fully expecting to lose money on every copy. Um, uh, but as we now know, of course, it, it exploded in popularity in the 1960s. Um, and as he said in an interview in 1965, nobody had been more staggered about the, about the uh, popularity, unless it was perhaps my publisher, Stanley Unwin, uh, who, who, who made an enormous profit uh, on, on the Lord of the Rings. Uh, and, and of course, you know, the rest is history, as they say. Um, uh, you know, Frodo lives, uh, of course, uh, go, go, Gandalf, all these slogans that, that, that uh, became uh, popular in the 60s among the counterculture in the U.S. Uh, uh, Frodo lives with a scribble on the inside of subway uh, lines and, and things like that. Uh, Tolkien's reaction to it was kind of amused that he didn't really know what to make of it. Uh, he said in an interview in 1968, I observed in general that North America has always been more easily kindled than England or indeed any country in Europe. He thought that, that, that the U.S. being such a young country had a bunch of uh, spitfires that were, that they were ready to get uh, revved up by uh, anything, even if it were this strange, fantastical book written by an Oxford Don half a little way. Um, but I think then the key question becomes, what is this? Why, why is this true? Why, why on earth is this enormous book that, that came out in, 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 from a fairly unknown author in the 1950s? What what caused its its popularity? Why why is it why has it become what it is? Um, uh, the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit both contain no references to Christianity. Uh, while at the same time, Tolkien said before the book was even published in uh, 1953, he, wrote, he was writing to someone who read a, uh, a pre-publication copy. The Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic book. Um, this was this was something he was always adamant about was that was that his, his Profound love of, of Catholicism and Christianity more broadly was really at the root of everything he did, um, and so it's it's a strange thing uh, where, where there's a consistent theme in, in Tolkien's post-publication of the Lord of the Rings life that people would always ask him what it's about. He was always out of it. There's no allegory. There's no there's no religion. There's none. There's none of this stuff. But of course, it is it is religious, um, uh, and of course, people were quick in the post World War II days. To start comparing it to, to World War II, to say that Sauron was an emblematic of Hitler or fascism more generally, um, and so it's very obvious. It was, it was a common critique was, was that this is an obvious allegory. It's, it's sort of childish. And it's, it's really not. Uh, there's not really enough depth to it. Um, this is a, a uh, an interview he gave in 1962, uh, sort of before the immense popularity of the Lord of the Rings began. Uh, about this very, very topic. There is a temptation to read in the book, a kind of allegory of the age form. I, I mean, what is said somewhere in the book is that the One Ring is a power so enormous that even if a good man were to use it against a bad, it would corrupt the good man. But that is the thing which other people have arrived, I do know people have arrived at long before age forms invented. Uh, also, they said that again, building the, the stories in which uh, the Dark Lord uh, was an adventurer. Already in the last stage during the first war, it's not even been heard of. Now, Tolkien is sort of notoriously difficult to understand, and scores words a lot despite being a professor of, of modern languages uh, <laughs> of English. Uh, it was horrible at speaking, so if you didn't catch that, I will paraphrase. Um, the interviewer asks, uh, there's a temptation just to see the one ring as an allegory of the H bomb, and then and it's sort of it's, it's atomic power, it's being, it's being uh, sort of parts by, by either or both sides. Um, I told you to respond, that's something that people have been saying for years. They said it, they, you know, if people, people said it, uh, you know, the H-bomb wasn't even in existence uh, in, in, in uh, when Tolkien started writing. You must remember he was writing this. He began writing in 1937 and continued through 1949. So about half of the writing history of the book was done before the, the war even ended um, and before the, the bombs were dropped. Um, but he says that, uh, I may say that I began writing these when I was an undergraduate, and, and uh, they were already in advanced stage uh, when I was when uh, during the First World War, uh, and the age bomb hadn't been heard of, uh, which is he's exaggerating a little bit. The, the, the stories weren't really in the advanced stage during the First War; they were in the very early stage. But 
he was very quick always to deny any kind of um, practical connection. He even went so far in a 1965 interview, he, uh, he was asked, um, there's trees are all over the Lord of the Rings as these kind of symbols. Uh, the white tree of Gondor is this, this big symbol that, that is important to the book. Um, and the interviewer says, well, why did you use a tree as, as a symbol of, of kingship or lordship? And he's like, well, I didn't, that's not even true. It's like, well, it, of course, of course it's true. It's, it's right there. Obviously, it's on the banners, on the flags, the trees in the, in the courtyard. And he says, well, you know, there's leopards on the on the standard badges of, of England. So what's, what does that mean? Uh, like they're just emblems. He, he would say they're just emblems. They're not even symbols. I don't think in symbology. Uh, he was always eager to dispel any illusions that he had put any specific meaning in. It is a temptation. But then, of course, uh, and so as I say, here's here's another a line uh, of his that's that's uh, uh, famous in, in 1965 when the second edition of the Lord of the Rings came out, um, and all of this sort of stuff had been bubbling the surface about about uh, you know the world uh, asking what it's about. And thinking it's about atomic power, um, he explicitly spends paragraphs saying why it's not about atomic power, and says, "I cordially dislike allegory in all its manifestations, and have always done so since I grew old and wary enough to detect its presence." Um, and so he it, it was it's just a constant thing for him for, for, for years. Um, is this this great thing? But then in letters he would say it's an allegory of power. Um, so it, it's it was there's always a tension. He he, he really was was at odds with the world. I was very uh, grieved when people wanted to put specific meaning in. Um, the, the difference being that he saw uh, applicability, is what he called it, as being distinct, completely distinct from allegory. The domination of the author, he said, is allegory. Uh, what you have in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, where, where, where the story is, is a, a very straight-laced, one-to-one allegory of, of Christianity, uh, the line of the order, of course, of the death and resurrection of Christ in Aslan, and he was never wanted to have that in there. Uh, but at the same time, any, any story that, that plays into archetypes and into, into uh, sort of mythology is, is bound to have uh, uh, allegorical meanings to some degree. Um, but I think we're still sort of missing uh, why the Lord of the Rings is, is so resonant. It, it's, it's, it's almost paradoxical. It's, it's for a guy that had no meaning, or supposedly setting into it, it's resonated with millions of people and has done so for 65 years. It's, it's, it's never stopped. Uh, it's, it's always been uh, at the forefront of culture. There, there are still adaptations being made currently uh, that are expected to break in tons of money. Um, so the final question is so what? <laughs> so, so why why is there uh, why do we care about any of this? What is what is the point? Uh, is popularity alone enough to justify it? Uh, as I say here, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey has been. As is one of the best-selling books of all time, obviously. Uh, um, books like that do very well. Uh, Nicholas Sparks, uh, uh, you know, all of these different people that write these very kind of uh, what you might consider lowbrow uh, fiction uh, sell incredibly well. And so that's something that people levy against Tolkien all the time uh, and have done so for a very long time, is that it's just lowbrow. Right? It's popular because people are, are childish or they want to escape the world. Um, and. And there's, there's not really a whole lot of depth there if you, if you know what you're looking for. Um, but my argument would be, and what I will be getting into in, in, in the future, in, in, in these uh, various lectures uh, over the next few weeks, is that there's something critical about story for some people. And as I said before, um, you know, language and, and story, and, and the mixture of the two, and, and the, the birth of myth, and, and why stories have such a powerful resonance for uh, everywhere in the world, people everywhere in the world at all times, uh, the stories are always at the, at the key, uh, always the key to understanding a culture. Um, they're, they're manifestations of human experience in a very pure way. Uh, the, the story, when you read Beowulf, even though there's very little known about the, the context of Beowulf or even who the poet was, that Beowulf is, 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 is touching upon an entire universe of meaning, an entire world of meaning, an entire perspective on the world that is, is no longer accessible to us, even if we have artifacts of people who lived at the time. And so it, it somehow, paradoxically, it's within the fantastic, it's, it's, within, it's within these stories of the metaphysical and the, and the fantastical that we find deep truths about humanity. Um, and so I, and I think a, a, a really great example for how important stories were to Bertolke, that he's not just pulling some bluff, that there's not, there's not just some 
He's not just writing a story and then, and then pretending it has deeper meaning. Um, this, is, this is the gravestone where he and his wife are buried. Um, and when his wife died, um, he, he engraved on a tombstone, it's Edith Mary Tolkien. And underneath that, it says Luthien. Uh, and, and underneath his name, when he was buried, his children put the name Pharaoh. Um, because for Tolkien, there was, there was no distinction, really. Uh, I mean, of course there was. I mean, he didn't believe he lived in this fictionally created world. But for him, the fictional mythological world is, is as real as the primary world, as he called it. That, that for him, the name Edith Tolkien was the same as the name Luthien. They, they were the same person on some, on some mythological level. And so in some way, he himself was in some way mythologized in, in the name Baron. Um, and so, you know, a man who, who was, was just playing with playing games with stories would never have done this, of course. Um, so he's either delusional or, or, or deeply affected, or both. Um, <laughs> uh, and so at last, uh, my, my, I guess, general thesis for, for Tolkien, more broadly, um, is that um, the reason Tolkien was so resonant in the past, and the reason he continues to be, is that the modern post-Enlightenment world is, is sort of starved for mythological truth. Um, and not that we don't have it. I mean, it is, it is to be had all over the place in, in stories. Um, but Tolkien really understood that on, on a very profound level. Um, you know, having seen the real despair of mechanization and, and, and industrialized warfare in World War One, he, he was somebody who was profoundly in a position to really appreciate the, the, the importance and the impact that stories can have on the world. Um, I think everybody feels that to some degree. When, when the people who, who are struck by the Lord of the Rings and by Tolkien more broadly are feeling that passion that he had, that understanding that he had, um, and coming through for them in their own lives. Um, and so I'll end with a couple of reviews. Um, W.H. Auden uh, was, was a poem, a poet. Uh, it was very popular uh, at the time. Uh, he was actually a student of Tolkien's. Um, in his review of the Thoughts of the Ring, it was very, I think, I gave a very good description. Uh, One must feel that, however superficially unlike the world we live in, its characters, that is, the characters of the Fellowship of the Ring, and events may be, it nevertheless holds up the mirror to the only nature we know, our own. And so that's, you know, I think Auden really understood what Tolkien was going for. Um, but I think uh, the, the real power is revealed uh, in, in, you know, in, the, in, the, in a mythological kind of description, which is what C.S. Lewis gave. Uh, C.S. Lewis was a great friend of Tolkien's in his review of Tell's Book, who said, Here are beauties which pierce like swords or burn like cold iron. Here is a book that will break your heart. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I think those two perspectives, the sort of analytical uh, perspective of, of power mythology and the pure poetic exemplification of that power uh, is what is found in Tolkien and is what I uh, seek to explore and to explain. Thank you. What's the next lecture? I don't know yet. <laughs> it'll, it'll probably be uh, Tolkien wrote a lecture in uh, 1935 but he gave a lecture called On Fairy Stories, uh, which is fairly long and very good, uh, which lays out a, uh, his sort of entire perspective on what he called the fairy story, which he uses in a very broad sense. Uh, it, it applies to myth, it applies to religion, it applies to actual like Grimm's fairy tales, uh, so that's probably what we'll be exploring. So if anyone, it's, it's you can find it digitally online, uh, um, you know, uh, it's, if you want to read it beforehand, you're welcome to, but that's, that's probably where I'll be going with it, is to give Tolkien's kind of more precise form.